So if I were to try to summarize the Wolfram Physics Project, which is uh, you know something that's been in your brain for a long time, but really has just exploded in activity, you know, only just months ago. Yes. Uh, so it's an evolving thing, and it, next week you know, I'll try to publish this conversation as quickly as possible, because by the time it's published, already new things will probably have come out. So, uh, so, so if I were to summarize it, we've talked about the basics of there's a hypergraph that represents space. There is uh, transformations on that hypergraph that represents um, time. The progress of time. That progress of time. There's a causal graph that's a characteristic of this. And the basic process of science, of, yeah, of science within the Wolfram physics model is to try different rules and see which properties of physics that we know of known physical theories are appear within the graphs that emerge from that rule. That's what I thought it was going to be. Uh oh. Okay. The, so what? <laughs> they, so what? It is turns it? out we can do a lot better than that. It turns out that using kind of mathematical ideas, we can say, and computational ideas, we can we can make general statements, and those general statements turn out to correspond to things that we know from 20th century physics. In other words. The idea of you just try a bunch of rules and see what they do, that's what I thought we were going to have to do. Mm -hmm. um, but in, in fact, we can say, given causal invariance and computational irreducibility, we can derive, and this is where it gets really pretty interesting, we can derive special relativity, we can derive general relativity, we can derive quantum mechanics. And that's where things really start to get exciting, is you know, it wasn't at all obvious to me that even if we were completely correct, and even if we had, you know, this is the rule, you know, even if we found the rule, to be able to say, yes, it corresponds to things we already know, I did not expect that to be the case. And so for somebody who is a, a simple mind and definitely not a physicist, not even close, what does derivation mean in this case? Okay, so, so, so let me, this is an interesting question. Okay, so there's so one one thing in the context uh, of computational reducibility. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. So what you have to do, let me give, let me go back to a, again the mundane example of fluids and water and things yes. like that, right? So so you have a bunch of molecules bouncing around. You can say, uh, just as a piece of mathematics, I happen to do this from cellular automata back in the mid 1980s. You can say, just as a matter of mathematics, you can say the continuum limit of these little molecules bouncing around is the Navier-Stokes equations. That's just a piece of mathematics. It's not, it doesn't rely on, uh, you have to make certain assumptions that you have to say there's enough randomness in the way the molecules bounce around that certain statistical averages work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, it is a very similar derivation to derive, for example, the Einstein equations. Okay, so the way that works roughly the Einstein equations are about curvature of space. Uh, curvature of space, I talked about sort of how you can figure out dimension of space. There's a similar kind of way of figuring out if you, if you just sort of say, um, uh, you know, you're making a, a larger and larger ball or larger and larger, if you draw a circle on the surface of the earth, for example, you, you might think the area of a circle is pi r squared, but on the surface of the earth, because it's a sphere, it's not flat, the, the area of a circle isn't precisely pi r squared. As the circle gets bigger, the area is slightly smaller than you would expect from the formula pi r squared as a little correction term that depends on the, the ratio of the size of the circle to the radius of the Earth. Okay, so it's the same basic thing. It allows you to measure from one of these hypergraphs what is its effective curvature. And that's... Oh, so um, the little piece of mathematics that uh, explains special general relativity is... Uh, can map nicely to describe fundamental property of the hypergraphs, the curvature okay, of the so, hypergraphs. So special relativity is about the relationship of time to space. General relativity is about the curvature, curvature in, in this space represented by this hypergraph. So what is the curvature of a hypergraph? Okay, so first I have to explain, what we're, we're explaining is, first thing you have to have is a notion of dimension. You don't get to talk about curvature of things. If you say, oh, it's a curved line, but I don't know what a line is yet. So Yeah, it, what is the dimension of a hypergraph then? Where From where, we, we've talked right. about effective dimension, but 
Right, that, that's, what, that's what this is about. That's a, what this is about is, you have your hypergraph, it's got a trillion nodes in it. Yeah. What is it roughly like? Is it roughly like a grid, a two-dimensional grid? Is it roughly like all those, all those nodes are arranged on a line? What's it roughly like? And there's a pretty simple mathematical way to estimate that by just looking at the, the, uh, this thing I was describing, this sort of the size of a ball that you construct in the hypergraph. That's a, you just measure that, you can just you know, compute it on a computer for a given hypergraph, and you can say, oh, this thing is wiggling around, but it's, it's roughly corresponds to two or something like that, or it roughly corresponds to 2.6 or whatever. So that's how, you, that's how you have a notion of dimension in these hypergraphs. Curvature, is something a little bit beyond that. It's if you look at the how the size of this ball increases as you increase its radius, curvature is a correction to the si size increase associated with dimension. It's a sort of a second order term in in the in determining the size. Just like the area of a circle is roughly pi r squared, so it goes up like r squared. The two is because it's in two dimensions, but when that circle is drawn on a big sphere. The, the actual formula is pi r squared times one minus uh, r squared over a squared and some coefficient. So in other words, there's a correction to, and that correction term, that right. gives you curvature. And that correction term is what makes this hypergraph correspond, have the potential to correspond to curved space. Now, the next question is, is that curvature, is the way that curvature works, the way that Einstein's equations for general relativity you know, is it the way they say it should work? And the answer is uh, yes. And really? the and so, how does that work? The I mean, you the the calculation of the curvature of this hypergraph for for some some set of rules. No, or? it doesn't matter what the rules are. It doesn't so long as they have causal invariance and computational irreducibility, and and wow. they lead to finite dimensional space, fi non infinite so dimensional in, space. Yeah. Oh, non oh, dimension. dimensional it can grow infinitely but it can't be infinite dimensional so what does a infinitely dimensional hypergraph look like so that tree, means for example so in a tree you start from one root of the tree yeah. it doubles doubles again doubles again doubles right. again and that means if you ask the question starting from a given point how many points do you get to Remember, in like a circle, you get to r squared with a two there on a tree you get to for example two to the r it's exponential dimensional, so to speak, or infinite dimensional. Do you have a sense of, in the space of all possible rules, how many uh, lead to uh, infinitely dimensional hypergraphs? Is uh, that? No. Okay. <laughs> is, is that an important thing to know? Or yes, just... it's an important thing to know. I right. would love to know the answer to that. And, but, but, you know, it gets a little bit more complicated because, for example, it's very possibly the case that in our physical universe, that the universe started infinite dimensional and it only, uh, it, as it as the you know at the Big Bang, it was very likely infinite dimensional, and as um, as the universe sort of expanded and cooled, its dimension gradually went down. And so one of the bizarre possibilities, which actually there are experiments you can do to try and look at this, the universe can have dimension fluctuations. So in other words, we think we live in a three dimensional universe, but actually there may be places where it's actually 3.01 dimensional or where it's you know 2.99 dimensional. And it may be that in the, in the very early universe, it was actually infinite dimensional and it's only a late stage phenomenon that we end up getting three dimensional space. But from your perspective of the hypergraph, the, the, one of the underlying assumptions you kind of implied, but you have a sense, a hope um, set of assumptions that the, the rules that underlie our universe or the rule that underlies our universe is static. Is that the, one of the assumptions you're currently operating under? Uh, yes, but there's a, there's a footnote to that, which we should get to because it requires a few more steps. Okay. Well, actually <laughs> then but let's backtrack to the curvature because we're yes. talking about as long as it's finite dimensional, uh, Finite dimensional computational irreducibility and causal invariance, then it follows that uh, the uh, that the large scale structure will follow Einstein's equations. And now let me again qualify that a little bit more. There's a little bit more com complexity to it. The um, uh, okay, so Einstein's equations in their simplest form apply to the vacuum, no matter just the vacuum, and they say. In particular, what they say is if you have, um, uh, so there's this term geodesic, uh, 
That's a term that means shortest path, it comes from measuring the shortest paths on the earth. So you, you look at a bunch of, a, a bundle of JD6, a bunch of shortest paths. It's like the paths that photons would take between two points. Then the statement of Einstein's equations is basically a statement about a certain, the, that as you look at a bundle of JD6, the structure of space has to be such that although the, the cross-sectional area of this bundle may, the, the, although the actual shape of the cross-section may change, the cross-sectional area does not. Mm -hmm. That's a version, that's, a, that's the most simple-minded version of r mu nu minus a half r g mu nu equals zero, which is the, the more mathematical version of Einstein's equations. It's a statement, it's a statement of the thing called the Ricci tensor is equal to zero. Um, that's, that's Einstein's equations for the vacuum. Okay, so we get that in, um, as a result of this model, but footnote, big, you know, big footnote, because all the matter in the universe is the stuff we actually care about. The vacuum is not stuff we care about. So the question is, how does matter come into this? And for that, you have to understand what energy is in these models. And um, one of the things that we realized, um, you know, last, late last year, was um, that there's a very simple interpretation of energy in these models, okay? And energy is basically, well, intuitively, it's the amount of activity in these hypergraphs and the way that that remains over time. So a little bit more formally, you can think about this causal graph as having these edges that represent causal relationships you can think about, oh boy, there's one more concept that we didn't get to. This, this, What's that? The notion of space-like hypersurfaces. So the, this, is, this is, a, is not as scary as it sounds. Yeah. The, the, um, it, it's, a, it's a common notion in general relativity. It's a, the notion is you are, you are defining what is a possibly, what is, what, um, where in space-time might be a particular moment in time. So in other words, what, what is a consistent set of places where you can say this is happening now, so to speak? And, and you make this series of, of, of sort of slices through the space-time, uh, through this causal graph to rep represent sort of what we consider to be successive moments in time. Okay. It's somewhat arbitrary because you can you can deform that if you're going at a different speed in special relativity. You tip those things. If you're you can you know there there are different kinds of deformations, but only certain deformations are allowed by the structure of the causal graph. Anyway, be, be that as it may, the, the 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 basic point is there is a way of figuring out. You know, you say what is the energy associated with what's going on in this in this hypergraph, and the answer is there is a precise definition of that. And it is, the formal way to say it is, it's the flux of causal edges through space-like hypersurfaces. The slightly less formal way to say it, it's basically the amount of activity. The, the, see, the reason it gets tricky is you might say it's the amount of activity per unit volume in, mm -hmm. in this yeah. hypergraph, but you haven't defined what volume is. So it's, it's, it's a little bit, you have so to be a little bit But this hypersurface gives some more formalism to that. Yeah, yeah. That, it gives, that it gives a way to connect that. To but intuitive, we should think about as the just the uh, amount of act activity. activity. Right. So, so the amount yeah. of activity that kind of remains in one place in the hypergraph corresponds to energy. The amount of activity that is kind of where an activity here affects an activity somewhere else cause, corresponds to momentum. And, um, and so one of the things that's kind of cool is that I'm trying to think about how to say this intuitively. The mathematics is easy, but the, the intuitive version, I'm not sure. But basically, the way that things sort of stay in the same place and have activity is associated with rest mass. And so one of the things that you get to derive is E equals mc squared. Um, that is a consequence of this interpretation of energy in terms of the way the causal graph works, which is a the whole thing is sort of a consequence of this whole story about updates and hypergraphs and so on.